So next week is homecoming. Let me remind you of that. We're having, it's a little different this year. We're having a special speaker to come. His name is Cameron Dula. And his, uh, his family is going to be singing some. I think Chris may have one or two lined up for us as a church to sing. And then his family is going to sing. Unique because his, his daughter is only like eight. And boy, she can belt it out. And I, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, Cameron's father is, uh, father-in-law is Leonard Fletcher from Dyson Grove Baptist in the mountains. And Leonard has written a lot of songs, uh, some that you would know. But uh, Cameron, his wife, and their two children, I think, are going to be singing some. And he'll be preaching for us. Cameron's a wonderful preacher. I'm looking forward to that. Also, this week, you mentioned I'll be preaching for the association all week long, so thank you for your prayers, and if you're able to make it Wednesday, since y'all decided to do that, that's fine. I'll be look, looking forward to see you. So here we are in Acts chapter 16. It's sad to say, and I hate to even have to mention this, but the confusion is in our day is not so much about what makes a godly woman as it is what is a woman? Isn't that sad? I mean, that is just one of the most sad and confusing states of, that humanity's ever been in. And of course, it's, that's just a sign, a symptom of what the Bible says would happen. to be great falling away. And even in our cultural Christianity, where everybody wants to claim to be a Christian in America, or at least they used to, uh, there's still a great deal of misunderstanding about what being a Christian is. But in a church that loves Christ, that's born of him, that is created by him, there is no confusion about what a woman is. As a matter of fact, the Bible is very specific, not only about what a woman is or what a man is, but it's very specific about what a godly woman and a godly man are. Uh, as heartbreaking as that is, I'm persuaded that you understand that, and that's what you're interested in. And while the world is actually struggling with gender identity, we're not, because the Bible has given us all we need to understand the spiritual identity of what we are to be. I want to read here in uh, Acts chapter 16 about Paul and Silas and about their beginning a relationship with a woman named Lydia who lived in a city called Philippi. Now, chapter 16, Paul is and Silas are on that first or on that second missionary journey actually. He had already parted from Barnabas, but uh, here they are traveling through the country and ministering and so they are in a place where Paul receives a vision. The vision is of a man standing and beckoning to him, asking him to come to Macedonia. Macedonia was named after Philip of Macedon, uh, Alexander the Great's father. And um, this was heavily Roman in culture. As a matter of fact, all of that area was, was, was basically Hellenistic and Roman to the core. But after receiving that vision, they strike out and go to Philippi. And in verse 11, we pick up, Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is a chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. The city of Philippi was a colony. That meant that everyone in the city was a Roman citizen. Paul would have understood that because he was a Roman citizen. Not everyone in that ancient time was a Roman citizen, but to be a citizen of the Roman Empire had perks. There were rights that were granted, and everyone in Philippi was such. And so on the Sabbath day, verse 13, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spoke unto the women which had resorted or which had gathered there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken 
of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful in the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now I want you to skip ahead to verse 40 in this same chapter, I believe it is. And so this is after Paul and Silas were thrown into prison in the city of Philippi. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. As you know, the main character here in this text is a woman named Lydia. I always thought that's a very beautiful name. And um, it, was, it was also the name of the area, the district, I think, that this woman was from. Her hometown of Thyatira was in the district of Lydia. And she was named after that, undoubtedly, and that's become a very beautiful feminine name through the years. And I've always imagined that she probably herself was just as beautiful as her name was. The Bible says she was a businesswoman. She was a merchant. She was a seller of purple. That means that she sold merchandise, most likely clothing, robes, different things that were dyed in a special dye that was actually gathered and produced in her hometown of Thyatira. But here she is in Philippi. Now you understand that it was Paul's practice everywhere he went when he went into a city to first of all go to the synagogue. He went to the synagogue because there he would find other Jewish people, people that he would have common ground with. Paul being a Jew, having grown up a very strict Jew, being lettered in Jewish law. And so he would automatically, almost always, be granted permission to speak in the synagogue. And that's the point at which he would preach the gospel. But it's interesting here that, that there was a large Jewish population in Thyatira, but undoubtedly there wasn't enough in Philippi to have a synagogue. Now, Paul and Silas, I think, were searching for a synagogue, and they couldn't find one. And when they realized there, there was not a synagogue, they began to walk through the city, and there they stumbled upon, if you believe in fate or coincidence, they were led, I think, to a group of women who were beside the river there in Philippi, and they were having a prayer meeting. It seems like the, the leader of this meeting, this group, this ga gathering, this women's Bible study, whatever you want to call it, was indeed Lydia. And so when Paul finds them, they received his message. He preached the gospel to them. And in so doing, there is unleashed this faith, this persona, this person named Lydia who becomes an extremely important figure and person in the church in Philippi. Now let me just say that, ladies, nowhere, nowhere, anywhere is it said that God does not think you are as important as any man. As a matter of fact, in the ancient world, true equality was only realized and understood in the context of Christianity. Christianity was the first religion to raise women and understand and identify them for who they really are. And that is precious, important, indispensable daughters of God. I'm here to tell you that feminism has twisted those ideas. And ladies, you understand that secular feminism is not your friend. It doesn't have an ounce of godliness to it. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's formulated and and, and, and advanced by, by evil. Because what it does, it brings confusion to the family and to God's created order. Now, I am firmly a complementarian. What I mean by that is that men and women have roles in the church. And I'm also here to tell you that those roles have nothing to do with equality. Nothing. You are as important to God and to this church as anybody, any man here, you are just as important. But God has also communicated exactly how he wants things done. We are bound to obey that if we want his blessing. 
And in our day, it's becoming increasingly harder to do that because of the misrepresentation of feminist doctrine. I'm here to tell you, if you want significance, if you want to understand who God has made you to be and live your fullest life possible, live it for Jesus, obeying God's word. Amen? So here's a woman, Lydia. Now, when we first meet her, we, we don't know a great deal about her background, but, but I think there are three ideas in this text that teach us how it is that God uses a godly woman. We are able to see Lydia from the very beginning her, at her conversion. And by the time we're through, hopefully through our sanctified and perfectly biblical imagination, I think we will see how God used Lydia in her life and in her church. The first idea I want to share with you is that Lydia was a godly woman. She was a woman whose heart had been opened by the Lord. You look at uh, verse number 14. The Bible says, A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? We have been talking recently about the fact that nobody, and I mean nobody, comes to Christ. Nobody has a conversion experience unless God draws them to himself. A lost person cannot understand spiritual truth unless God opens their understanding. For me to understand the cross, it took the Holy Spirit to enlighten me. For you to understand the gospel, it took the Holy Spirit to enlighten you. And that's exactly what Luke is saying here. Here was a woman whose heart God had already opened. Now, look with me in amazement, if you will, at the process that brings Lydia to Christ. Lydia, we are told, was a God-fearer. She feared God. Now, that is actually a proper designation. What I mean by that is Lydia was a number, one of a number of Gentiles who in some way had been exposed to the God of the Jews. And she had decided as a Gentile to seek him, to follow him, not necessarily to become Jewish in every way, but to follow and to pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so for whatever reason, and from whatever influence God had used, what Lydia had heard and seen to open her heart to be ready for the gospel. We've seen that in several places in the book of Acts, haven't we? I'm thinking about the man named Cornelius. God actually sent Simon and Peter to him because in the same way God had opened Cornelius' heart, he was a God-fearer. He was searching for, he was diligently wanting to know the God of, of Israel. And so that's who Lydia was. I'll also point out to you that Lydia was leading a group of women seeking this God when there wasn't even a synagogue in the city of Philippi for Paul to visit and try to speak and have influence in. That tells you something about her, doesn't it? Every time I hear somebody want to make the point that there were certain women in the Bible that God used as prophets or as leaders, there's no disputing, no disputing whatsoever that God used women in a mighty, mighty way. I mean, the list is just too long to even try to enumerate all the way back to, to, to Moses' mother who hid him in the bulrush. What a tremendous amount of faith that was. Moving through the Old Testament, Rahab, people like Ruth who exhibited faith, all of those things. And the, the book of Judges, my goodness, you've got Deborah who's such a powerful leader in the nation of Israel. But every time, if you'll allow me to say this, with the right heart, don't get mad at me. But every time a woman is raised up to lead, it's because there's an absence of sorry men who won't do it. Now, some of you are shaking your head. I hope you agree with me. Prove me wrong. Deborah was the judge because there was nobody else fit to be one. Now, that doesn't mean she wasn't. But she was in the right place with the right heart, and God used her. 
One of the things I've noticed through the years, there's a lot of churches whose doors are still open today because God used godly women to keep them open. One thing I've noticed through the years as well is that if one parent doesn't come to church, it's almost always the dad who doesn't come. Tells you how sorry we are, men. But after all, I've watched it over and over and over again, how God uses faithful, godly women in their family and in their church when men won't even step up. Listen, I'll be the first one to thank God for women who are willing to be used of God in that way. I think we're going to see a little bit of that in Lydia as she is there for the formation of this, of this church. But the thing that jumps out here is that Lydia already had a spiritual priority. She was meeting with these women on the Sabbath day, seeking the God of Israel, and just so happened, yeah, you believe in coincidences, right? Especially when it comes to God. Just so happened, Paul and Silas found them. Isn't this a beautiful picture of how God has people at the right time, in the right place, in the right season to move in their heart, and he brings the gospel to them so that they can believe because she didn't understand the gospel at this point but her heart was open i'm here to tell you god always responds to an open heart people wondering why does that god let me know this or why does that god lead me in this way probably because our heart is not open we don't have to have all the information we don't have to have all the answers but we sure do have to have an open heart ladies i want to say something to you Women are finding more and more influence in the world, and that's fine. Women are climbing ladders and doing things they've never done before. But I'm here to tell you right now, when we stand before Christ, the only accomplishments, the only influence, the only weight that you will have on that day, just like any man, is not what you accomplished in the business world, not how much money you've garnered, not how famous or accomplished your kids are intellectually or in business, but it's going to be about how spiritual you were in the home and how you led your children to be the same. When I think of church history, very seldom are there men who accomplished anything, anything, without having a godly spiritual mother behind them. Do not believe the lie of secular feminism that says your work in the home is not important because it is. Now, I want to add something here, and I want you to be careful not to misunderstand me. What I'm about to say now, I'm not implying that a woman's place is in the home. I'm not saying that. I want to get out of here alive, okay? But, but, notice what specifically is said about Lydia in the next verse. The Bible says that when she hears the gospel spoken by Paul in verse 14, she attended to it. That means she believed. Very simple. Her heart was opened by the Lord even further to receive the gospel, and she believed. And then it says she was baptized. Now, it's interesting to me that the first thing she does is, is demonstrate how her heart was open by the Lord, and then it was open to the Lord. She wanted to do spiritual things, but then here comes this second idea that helps us to understand how God was going to use her. The Bible says that not only was her heart opened by the Lord, but it tells us that her home was opened by her. She opened her home to these missionaries. Look in verse number 15. And when she was baptized... And her household. By, you think she had some clout? Lydia probably had a little bit of this. Uh, it's good to see Bobby here this morning. He would love to have some of this fabric. Some of the most valuable stuff in the ancient world. At least Julia would, right? She would have it on Facebook. We got this at Roby's Purple. Come get it. It's expensive stuff. Lydia was the vendor. She ha probably had a straight... Source from Thyatira, Lydia was a businesswoman, accomplished. She was matronly. And so you, you see her faith, and notice how quickly her, her family followed. Now, you've heard it preached like I have. Well, you can't, you can't get to heaven on your mama's faith. No, you can't. But there are many of you here today who have faith, and God used your mama's faith to help you have it. Right? 
or your father's faith. Uh, Their faith did not guarantee you being a Christian, but it sure made some other things plain for you to understand. And so that's what happened. Lydia, you you see the respect her family has for her. She was baptized immediately, and her household with her. Now, don't don't think they're rushing them through, but her family believed when, when they saw that it was good enough for mama, they latched onto it themselves, and they believed. And the first thing she did, when all the pieces came together, after she attended and after she believed, she immediately offered her home as a lodging for those missionaries. One of the great deceptions, again, brought about by the world today is that greater influence for a man or a woman is found out there. Listen very carefully to me. The primary influence God has for both you and me to have is in our family. The faith, the godliness that you and I as parents give to our children is probably the most weighty, consequential thing we will ever, ever attempt. And I say that not to give anybody a guilt trip, but I'm here to challenge you. Now, you say, well, I blew it with my kids. Well, you know what? God will, and they'll have grandkids. Don't blow it. I thought, man, there's a lot of things I wish I'd go back and do over. All of us believe that. But sometimes I have the girls around, it's sort of nice thinking, I got another chance to do it better than I did the first time. Well, spiritual influence in the home cannot be undermined or or the value of it cannot be diminished because instructions for spiritual leaders are clear. The Bible says that if a man is not able to lead his own children spiritually, he can't be a leader in God's house. That's, that's what he says for a man. If they can't control and lead their own children to faith in Christ, they don't have any business trying to lead somebody else. At the same time, if a man can't lead his spouse, that he can't lead anything else if a woman can't lead her children toward Christ how can she be a leader out there if she doesn't lead them in the home I suppose I'm just struck by the way this woman immediately opens up her heart then she opens up her home and in effect what she's saying is come and see everything about me this is how sold out I am to Christ everything that I am come into my home and stay but We don't have much hospitality anymore. used to be that hospitality, especially in these days, was a very important thing. There were no, you know, uh, awkward ends back then. Thank the Lord. But anyway, there was no place you could just go check in. That just wasn't a thing. And so if you were going to find housing, most of the time, especially in Palestine, it had to be within a home. And the Jews especially were expected to grant hospitality to open their home to travelers that extended even to Christians and God gave Christians instruction to to especially for those of the household of faith to open our homes to them I remember when I was a little boy there were preachers sometimes big name preachers who would come and preach from in my home church for my grandfather or for Abby's chapel when he was there and they would stay with him he when he was gone out of town sometimes he would stay with somebody else and it's just like we don't even do that anymore and and even that level of hospitality is gone but think about what that meant that meant that this woman was willing to be transparent in everything as long as she could be of service to Christ that's where her heart was God opened her heart and she consequently opened her home but the story doesn't end there this is where it really gets good now you got to put your little imaginary hats on and take a little journey with me okay your imagination hats I'm taking you back to kindergarten y'all think about this it's really not a much imagination because we get clues as to what happened immediately after these missionaries go into um, into her house and I'm sure everybody's rejoicing her household she's been baptized and her household's been baptized they go back out ministering on the street her home undoubtedly becomes a base of operation Lydia has enough money to support them, willing to do it, Father Lair. But then 
things start to get rough. And what happens begins in verse 16. This is, by the way, the third idea I want to share with you. And that is not only how her heart was open and how her home was open, but also how the heritage of her church was founded on her faith. Look with me. In verses 16 through 22, I'm not going to take time to read. What you have there is a story of a little girl or a young damsel who is demon-possessed and who is, is controlled by certain masters who are making money off of her. And so when Paul and Silas are going through Philippi, the demons in that little girl recognize these two men. And they began to try to dissuade people from listening to them, and they began to try to interrupt things. And the little girl was just causing, I'm not sure how little she was, maybe a young teenager, she was causing a disruption. And Paul and Silas couldn't preach where they were. And so Paul turns around to her, and he casts the demon out of her. Tremendous story. And so once the demon is cast out of her, she calms down. She's not... She's not yelling and screaming, disrupting things. And the Bible says there in one of those verses that, uh, verse 19, when her master saw that the hope of her gains were gone, their gains were gone, she was making them money. When they saw that she no longer was possessed, she wasn't acting the way that she always had, and they realized, oh, wow, they've messed up our money maker. That's what they thought. They got angry, all right? And... They turned them over to the authorities there in Philippi. They're going to go to jail. Let's well, stop there for a second. You know what happens in jail. We're not there yet, but you know what happens. But I want to pose this question. So Paul and Silas are thrown in jail. The people who owned and who managed this, this possessed girl are now void of their moneymaker. They're not going to take care of her. All they wanted out of her to begin with was to abuse her and use her. And now that she's not profitable, who does she have? It's not hard for me to imagine how at this point, Lydia, this woman of faith, this very special woman, becomes a spiritual mother for this little one who was rescued. Hmm. If they were in prison, who was taking care of this abandoned young woman. It's not hard to imagine, is it? If Lydia had opened up her home to these missionaries, I don't have a problem in the world seeing Lydia going up to this little damsel and saying, you come home with me. And so there she goes. I can see Lydia when the girl enters into her home, goes into her closet or they didn't have closets, but you just, just stay with me, okay? Uh, her little chest, and she pulls out the most beautiful purple robe this girl's ever seen. And she takes it, and the girl's eyes are wide with amazement as she slips it around her shoulder. And I can see this young girl, very hesitant, very shy, as Lydia calls her to eat with the rest of her family. But Lydia makes sure that she feels welcome. I think that both the girl and Lydia having a brand new relationship with the Lord, but Lydia is already using the spiritual gifts that God has given her to comfort and maybe even to counsel this girl who ha has had a horrible past and helps her through it. She becomes to her the mother that she never had. You know, we live in a day, there, ladies, the, listen, Paul says this, the book of Titus, part of your spiritual assignment, hey, this is not a burden, this ought to be a joy to you, part of your spiritual assignment and the assignment of men in the same way is to bring along younger women, bring them along in the faith. Now, ladies, I tell you something, it's easy to step back and criticize younger generations your the generation that was older than you criticized your generation didn't they you remember that some of y'all might have been old hippies i don't know 
your parents didn't like that, but they loved you anyway, and they got you through it. Isn't it amazing how every generation coming along behind is criticized by the one older? And I admit, today, sometimes i got to scratch my head and wonder what in the world they're thinking. But here's the thing. Do you realize how many young women, I'm serious now, I'm not making this up, do you realize how many young women have either lived in a home where the mother wasn't there and even though she was there she was absent in all the wrong in all the bad ways need need a spiritual mother there's some of you here today you could give account and say yeah i would not be where i am if somebody a woman older than me had not come along beside me and helped me so, if you're here this morning and you think, well, I've reached the age where I really can't do anything for God, as long as you're breathing, there are younger women who need your godly influence. That's biblical, ladies, and that is that for which we all will be held accountable, even as men bringing younger men along. So, she became a spiritual mother. But secondly, I think she also became a spiritual matron to those in the faith. You begin reading in verse 19, won't take time again to read it, but casting the demon out of that little girl, Paul and Silas got him in trouble. They had disrupted the, the ability of these men to make money. These men were angry. They blamed them for causing a ruckus. They had tied them to Jews who were already being persecuted, and so they were thrown into prison. You know this story. There they are in prison. They're in stocks and bonds and and Paul and Silas, instead of griping, complaining, and yelling, and making a ruckus, they began to sing. And God was so honored that he began to applaud, and the whole building shook. Earthquake. I think the door is flung open. I think the jailer was there. I think he was probably sleeping with his head back on his desk that knocked him out of his chair. He gets up and all of a sudden he realizes all the doors are open and he takes out the knife because he's going to kill himself because if he loses prisoners, the Romans are going to kill him anyway, so he might as well be done with it now. Paul stops him and says, whoa, we're still here. Don't do that. And he witnesses to him. Beautiful, wonderful story. This guy gets saved. And his household. See, the same kind of thing. Well, after they are saved, he is saved and his family, where do they go? Well, the Bible says all the way in verse 40 that they all went back again to Lydia's house. Now, I can see in my imagination this, this man weeping as he watches Lydia. And the others dress the wounds on the backs of Paul and Silas that just maybe he had inflicted. And it dawns on him just what he had done and how long he had not served God and how he wasn't worthy. But now he is saved and he knows he's part of this family, but he can't believe what he's seeing. And there he sits, weeping as he watches those men wince in pain. But he realizes they're all in Christ now. Something's new, something's different, and they're in Lydia's home. One of the great blessings, I think, that I've ever gotten from reading the books of my good friend Ray Rhodes about Susanna Spurgeon. His biography made such waves, it's in like his fifth printing, which is just not heard of in Christian books now. Unfortunately, it's so commercial, but God's blessed that. And I think what's resonating with people is that they realize how strong Susanna Spurgeon was. You don't hear much about her in, in Spurgeon's ministry. Spurgeon is widely acclaimed as probably the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul himself. And if you've ever read any of his sermons, you will definitely be stirred by them in a wonderful way. But I'm here to tell you, and you should get those books and read them, first biography since 1915 proves and shows that if it were not for her, we wouldn't know anything about him. She's the one who saw to it that his sermons were published. And this woman, who was a strict complementarian, nonetheless understood her, her need to be obedient, and she was even instrumental in founding a church on the coast of England. 
In many ways, her legacy guaranteed and was responsible for the legacy of her husband, the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul. Hmm. Why that interesting? See how God uses godly women? Now go back with me to Philippi for a minute. Years have come and gone. Paul's already gone on to different towns, one other people to Christ. But now he is under house arrest, and he's writing letters back to churches that he needs to communicate with. And one of those churches, maybe even his favorite church, was the church at Philippi. He would write a letter back to that church, and I can see that. I, I think they're still meeting in Lydia's home. The messenger comes in. His name is Epaphroditus. He's the one that they had sent out earlier to check on Paul. When he goes to Rome and checks on him, Epaphroditus his, himself gets COVID or he gets sick and he's, he's, he's about to die. And so he's healed and the people at Philippi have heard that and they're like worried to death. And so Paul writes a letter back to them and sends it with Epaphroditus so they'll stop worrying about him so they'll also know that he's doing fine and to thank them for always being there for him. He says to them that letter, you were the only church. Everybody else stopped sending me any kind of help except for you. That tells you what this church was like. It's sort of like you people, very giving. And so I can see Epaphroditus as he walks back in the room, or walks into the room. Everybody's excited as he begins to unfold and open the letter. And he begins to read. If you look around that room, you may see over here a beautiful young mother. Her husband is beside her. She's clothed very well and modest, and she's just so beautiful. Her kids are all around her. And as he begins to read, a sweet smile of serenity comes on her face. If you'd seen her a few years earlier, she would have had a crazed look of fear, demonically inspired horror. But now she's just so peaceful. She's just so thankful. You can tell she's deeply in love with her husband or children and with Jesus. You would never believe how far she's come if you didn't read it for yourself. I've been here 30, almost 33 years. You people are getting old. Of all the things that God's let us see, there's only one thing that matters to me. And that is looking at young people who are coming into adulthood, already in adulthood, many of them having kids of their own who from all outward appearances and from their testimony are going to be solid as a rock in the faith. That's God's gift to this church. And frankly, that's the only thing that matters in many ways as to what we're doing. And God's blessed us richly with that. But she's not the only one there. Over in the other corner, there's a dignified older gentleman. He's a deacon. Everybody knows it. He welcomed you when you came in. And from the way he greeted you, you would have never known that he had quite the ability to inflict pain in the past. But it's been a long enough time now that the people he has helped in the name of Christ far outnumber the people he hurt in the name of Caesar. It's the jailer. His wife's still with him there. His kids who were baptized long ago and came to faith in him are there. You can tell he's important because of the respect he gained, he, he's gained and he's given. But then over in the back corner behind everybody else, you finally see her. It's an older lady by now. Still beautiful, still beautiful. But she's changed. She has a look on her face as she's looking over the congregation. She's not the pastor. But everybody knows how important she is. Everybody knows how valuable she is. And how 
They could not have made it this far without God's gift of her to this church. And Epaphroditus opens the letter and begins to read. And on every one of their faces, the tears begin to stream down because they remember how God delivered them beside a river and how God delivered them in the midst of a frenzied, angry mob and how God saved them and delivered them in the middle of a jailhouse being violently shaken by an earthquake. All those things fill their minds as they read these words that Paul has written to them. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day by the river until now. Being confident of this thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it meet for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart insomuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. I think Lydia's mind swirled as she wonders with amazement, thinking back to how God opened her heart and how that led to her coming to Christ when she heard the gospel. Now she looks around at these people and she's so thankful that God has used her to bring these into the family of God along with others. That's Lydia. Her brothers and sisters in her home every week. She loves it as much now as she did the first time it happened. God began a work and he's continuing it now. And that's how God uses a godly woman. I just want to encourage you. I think of so many of you, and Kim, I really appreciate you bringing your mother today. I don't think she can understand what I'm about to say. You know, there are women in our churches that we must look at and thank God for. And say, God put them in special places. And what they've done in serving us and serving God has made this church who and what it is. I still think we've got one of the strongest churches in Burke County. I'm thankful for that. And it's not because of me. It's because of faithfulness of individuals, including women. Some of you in your mind's eye, I can see it right now, are thinking back to your own mother. You would not be here today if it were not for her. But God, in his purpose and his plan, used her and her ministry in your life to bring you to himself. Amen? What a wonderful, beautiful thing that is. And one day in heaven, you will see her rewarded for what service she performed and for how she was a blessing to you. There are a lot of Lydia's. Sometimes we just miss them. Let's not miss them. Let's thank God for them. And ladies, my prayer for you, I don't care what your age is, become a Lydia and watch what God does. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for Lydia's example today. Lord, a shining example of how you use a person whose heart is open, whose home is open, whose life is open to be used of you. Lord, you have gifted the ladies in our church, to such a great extent. I just want to thank you for every one of them. And I pray for them in their ministry of motherhood. Lord, I can't imagine how hard it is to be in their shoes at times. But Lord, you've always been faithful to them. You have encouraged them. You have kept them. And you have enabled them to do what you've asked. Thank you for their faithfulness, both here in this place and church, but also in their home. I pray, God, you'll challenge all of us to understand that the only legacy that will last beyond this life is spiritual. Any inheritance we leave will fade away unless it is a spiritual inheritance. Father, energize and focus all of us to leave that kind of inheritance behind. Thank you for those that you are using and have always used. 
and for your empowerment in Jesus name as Kelly begins to play and nobody looks I just want to encourage you this morning there may be issues in your life for which you need God's strength and his help there may be children in your home that you are still praying for but I want to encourage you to keep praying for them maybe just in your heart right now you want to thank God 